And we're back on Inside the Ropes for our end of year specials and tonight we have brought back one of our favourite guests that we had on in 2012. He is a former ECW original, member of the BWO, leader of the right to censor, tech enthusiast, DDP yoga instructor and all around nice guy. It is Stevie Richards. Stevie, welcome back. Oh, thanks for having me back. I appreciate it. We had Christopher Daniels on the show a couple of weeks ago and yeah. you and him have something in common that both of you not too long ago celebrated having wrestled for over 20 years. And I think people would be hard, People would find it hard to believe that you've been wrestling that long because you don't look like somebody who's been wrestling for that long. Does it feel like, a, like ages ago when you started, or can you still sort of remember those early days of wanting to make it? Well, I, I, I've been over, in it over 23 years to be exact. This past November, I entered my 23rd year. Uh, and speaking of Christopher Daniels, man, I wish, I wish I looked half as good as that guy. He's about the leanest and most youthful looking wrestler not only in his 40s but in the business and chris chris is a great guy and i consider him to be one of my dearest friends uh throughout my career so saying all that i i i just feel like you know it's like a different person that i'm looking at when i look back just like he would or dustin or page or anybody we were so different back then we we thought we knew everything and we didn't know anything and now we're so smart that we realize we don't know nothing in our forties. So, yeah, uh, the level of humility comes with that that uh, amount of maturity. And um, it's funny because I guess back when you started uh, wrestling, <clears throat> the territories had sort of petered away, but a lot of sort of main roster wrestlers in the mainstream companies were veteran guys, maybe in their late thirties, early forties. And nowadays, it seems like a lot of the guys that are on the main roster of WWE or and in, some in TNA are sort of still in their twenties. Do you think you ben? Do you think there's a benefit from being able to sort of tour the world before getting on the main roster, or is there a benefit to being able to get there sooner and experience it all sooner? It's a lot of pressure, even in the ECW, which was pretty regional, even though it had a cult following throughout the world. Uh, it, you know, it still felt very regional, like an independent promotion. Uh, and there was pressure there. I couldn't imagine at 23, 24 years old. This is when I was doing the BWO and when I was, you know, really had the biggest push in my uh, uh, career at that time, I, I couldn't imagine, I imagine the pressure of WWE uh, then. I wasn't mature enough and even getting into the WWE a short few years after that, I didn't feel like I, I, I've experienced things and saw things uh, that that I probably wasn't mature enough to even interpret. And, you know, and then you have the politics thrown in there and the things backstage, which are, are 10 times more stressful than any injury or big pay-per-view match you could ever hope to have. So I don't know. I mean, I give it to the young guys that can handle the political pressure because there's guys that are my age and above that um, really have a lot of trouble with that. Well, it's, it's funny you mention that because I remember we had uh, Jerry Lynn on the show sh just before he retired. Awesome and, guy, yeah. Yeah, great, great guy. And he um he was talking about when he got to WWE in 2001. And he just, well, also in WCW, I think, he just said that he just wasn't interested in politics whatsoever. And he sort of just stayed away from it. And I just wondered, um, from your perspective, because you mentioned it a couple of times, how did you kind of react to sort of politics and wrestling? Did you kind of stay away from it, or did you kind of learn how to deal with it? What was your stance on it? Pretty much what Jerry did. I, 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 I always had a, I always had a thing where I would just treat everybody with respect and just work as hard as I can and let everything I kind of fall where it's going to fall. And the people that were in charge, like the Terry Taylors and other people, I stayed close with throughout the years because of that attitude and that that. that part of my personality which is pretty much all my personality of trying to treat others how i want to be treated however in wrestling it's a little bit different uh you're not really respected for being a nice guy nice guys kind of finish last a lot of times there jerry lynn's a a prime example of that all the talent in the world a nice guy and didn't want to play politics just wanted to work hard like in reality in the real world that's the way it should work if i want to work hard and concentrate I, you should get rewarded but for some reason that's very much a hindrance in the world and especially wrestling. At first it at first it ate away at me at first I got depressed. At first I I got angry and all the stuff all the gambit of emotions. Uh now I was just on the phone with my friend Dan McDevitt who used to wrestle on ECW with me and on the independence and we just laugh about it now and goof on it because what else can you do? Because it's been around forever and it it's not gonna change. So we just kinda laugh at that kind of stuff now. 
And I, also, when, when I was thinking about uh, you coming back on the show, and obviously the first time you came on, we covered kind of the almost like the greatest hits of your career. We talked about all the kind of big stuff. But I wondered, you know, you worked with Vince McMahon at various points, and so many people have different opinions on what he's like to work for and his interactions with him. What was Vince like with you? Was he was he the guy that you could knock on his door at any point and come up with an idea, or was, was he the sort of guy that you had to sort of pick and choose your times? What were your experiences with him? Uh, he was a lot more accessible, like right in the very beginning. And I didn't have to ha- even have that access because, uh, you know, I had a good rapport with the, the people on creative or the people booking or the agents, uh, as time went on, as you could see, there was more layers and more corporate and more bureaucracy put into there with, you know, the titles coming up to Stephanie, it's a hunter, it's all the other people. And then the writers, it, it's very, uh, very fragmented and Vince, Unless you're the top guy, unless, you know, there's a pecking order. So unless you're the guy making the most amount of money, that's the amount of attention he's going to give you. Uh, mm-hmm. That's the only way I can equate it. Did he ever come up to me and compliment me or critique me? Yeah, yeah, you bet he did. But it wasn't a consistent, like, this guy's going to guide me and mentor me. You know, he just, if the will drove him, he came up and said what he had to, and that was it. And um, and obviously, uh, part of the reason you're on today is to talk about uh, the upcoming Extreme Reunion shows that are going to be coming up later this month, and there's actually yep. going to be a television taping. So, obviously, earlier on this year, there was a bit of a kind of up-in-the-air feel because there was going to be events at WrestleMania weekend, and then they didn't happen. And uh, but now that but now it's coming back, and there's going to be television. Can you kind of tell us what the sort of what this year's been like in terms of it coming back? I would I would term it even up until today and up until the 28th. I'm very much a person that doesn't like to get their hopes up too much. Otherwise, I would have been disappointed by the Xbox One sitting in front of me. Uh, <laughs> but I don't get my hopes up, and I don't look at things. Uh, Al Snow has a great a great saying: "I'll believe it after it happens," and it's pretty true. I you know, and I'm, that that's not a slight on the the extreme rising officials or management or anybody. I told them how I felt. As a matter of fact, there's a text message exchange right before this interview between myself and the management about the way I feel about certain things. Uh, you know, as not the champion, but as somebody that they're investing uh, the time in with the TV tapings that are coming up and also the stuff that we're going to push out that was recorded throughout my title journey uh, leading up to winning the Extreme Rising title. I feel like I, 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 I can say something. You know, it... With WWE, I'd probably have to keep my mouth shut, but right now, I feel like it's my responsibility to guys like Luke's Haw- Luke Hawks and all the young talent that that uh, some of them say stuff, some of them don't. You know, it's my my job in a way to um, just open my mouth, and and you know what, it, it's it, whatever's going to happen after that's going to happen after that. I'm not going to sit there and cower in the corner and and not get my feelings. Now that being said, you know I that, you know, we're going to be at the arena. It's going to capture the authentic feel almost as much as possible of the of the original ECW, which obviously everybody's comparing it to. I feel like all the shows have really done that. They've really stood out and, and been very interactive. And, and the number one reason why, uh, you know, I, I just wanted to, have, wanted to work out and do all that stuff is I don't want the fans to get burned again like they did in April with all that stuff. The boys got... You know, they lost money, they lost this and that, but really the fans are the ones that really that probably felt cheated because they didn't get entertained and and uh, there was a big to-do about the, the, the uh, ticket money, which I hopefully has been solved now, by now. Uh, so, I mean, I know I'm ready to go. I'll be, I'll be in the best shape I can be and put on the best match I can put on and everything outside of my control, I, I just I, I can't think about that. Yeah, definitely, and f- fingers crossed, Evan. Evan's going to go ahead on the twenty eighth, and uh, is it? It's the twenty eighth and the twenty ninth. Am I right? Twenty eighth, December twenty eighth, correct. December twenty eighth, um, and you can get your tickets at Extreme Tix, which is t i x s dot com. Um, and also, I guess um, earlier on this year in October, you were part of uh, the House of Hardcore event uh, that Tommy Dreamer yes. was on. And um, what was that experience like? Because, again, some people are going to compare it to original ECW, but Tommy now, that was his third show, and he really has brought in a, a, an array of talent um, to work these yeah. shows. Well, you know, I mean, Tommy, I, I, what can be said about Tommy? I mean, he was right there with me throughout from the very first day I got into the business, and we've known each other for well over 20 years. On a personal level, I love Tommy. He's always going to be one of my closest uh, friends in wrestling and even outside of wrestling, and uh uh, for him to do things 
the way he's doing with House of Hardcore. I have to give him all the compliments in the world because uh, Tommy's not doing what a lot of promoters usually do and try to get too big too quick, run too many shows at once, try to get uh, you know the TV right away and try to compete with Vince. All the, all the different cliches you hear from every independent wrestling promoter, even all the way over there where you live, right? Everybody's yeah. always got these delusions of grandeur. Tommy is running it like a business, um, and it was a pleasure to be a part of it. And from, from beginning to end, uh, that entire weekend made me miss the business, made me miss being a full-time wrestler, uh, and to be able to see everybody uh, from you know from, from beginning to end at the show, the guys that were in ECW, the guys that weren't people just starting their first night in the business. Uh, it was just a great experience overall, and drawing 2,200 people at the Poughkeepsie at the Mid Mid to Hudson Civic Center doesn't hurt either. It was it was a really good night. Yeah, for sure. And um, and I guess kind of one of the things I was wondering, thinking about ECW back in the original ECW days, when working for Paul Heyman, what would you say you learned the most from Paul Heyman that you took with you in your career after you left there? Good or bad. Well, well, it wasn't just it wasn't just him, but it was a lot of people, you know. But Paul obviously motivated me and pushed me uh, to learn that I can push myself past my own limits. You know, he he instilled that in me by motivating me to, you know, like you heard, you know, motivated us all to run through a brick wall. You know, that's that's <laughs> the motivation that I give myself now. Uh, also, Paul, you know, obviously in a weird way taught me to to like Al Snow said, I'll believe it after it happens. And you know, it might seem like very insensitive at times with these promoters or or being short, but I only have so much mental and emotional and physical energy throughout the day to devote. I mean I'm doing this Skype interview, so obviously in a good way it's it's stimulating me mentally and you know, I, I but I still only have so much energy to concentrate throughout the day before I'm just totally burnt. I know you feel that way too, right? Yeah. You can't just be you know, and you know, I hear his war and peace. Read it by the end of the day. You're only going to be able to read the book so long. So, Paulie, Paulie, and other promoters and other people just had love to 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 do this long pitch and and motivate you and stuff like that. But after a while, just like uh, you know, a soccer or football coach, it becomes white noise. You know, that's why football coaches in America get fired because they you can only motivate these guys so much before they're like. Man, I heard the same bullshit speech for five years. I'm all right, whatever. And that's why teams, I think, get bad. And then, obviously, the right to censor gimmick that, that you were involved in was just phenomenal at the time. It was. Um, I, I remember being a kid at the time and just hating you on TV, which yeah. I guess meant you did your job. Uh, but when that originally came to you, that gimmick, was there any hesitation to do it, or was it kind of like, good God, this is a great character to just sink your teeth into? Oh man, you know, I I feel ashamed to say this, especially now since I did it again, but I really didn't want to cut my hair. That was the only thing like that <laughs> bothered me. It sounds so stupid because it really does. It turned out to be the best thing that I ever did. But, you know, I mean, I, I just like my hair long rather than short. It's just a personal preference. And I'm a pretty self-conscious guy, you know, bordering on insecure at times where long hair makes me feel a little more confident, you know, makes me feel a little more special. Mm -hmm. And that's just my own little thing. But when we cut it and, and they let me run with it because it wasn't meant to be a cult-style gimmick, I made it into it's only wanted it to be some kind of politician thing. So he really actually gave me the opportunity to turn it into something a little more um, interesting and mis mysterious and I think appealing to people in the long run. And what what was the reaction like when you started doing it? Because obviously, you know, there was a sort of a mocking of like the the parents' television council with the PTC thing a little bit and RTC. Was there a, was did you experience any sort of feedback from those sort of people, or did you not hear anything? Yeah, well, I I didn't personally, but I'm sure Vince did, and that's exactly what he wanted. I mean, come on, hey, you know, if they if they would have been as smart to ignore it like it never existed, but for them to put anything out, which I believe they did in public one one and once or twice, I mean, my goodness, you're just giving Vince everything he wants. You're giving him exposure. Yeah. I mean, he made he made money off of the fact that somebody was trying to take money out of the company. And I, the other thing I wanted to ask you about was uh, when you were part of TNA, you were part of their sort of ECW revival angle with EV. Oh, yeah. And 
here's just just this is just my take on it as a fan that, that watched it at the time. The only thing I didn't really understand was on TV, Dixie Carter would kind of say, you know, we want to give the ECW a proper goodbye. But in my head, I've been thinking, did they not have like three goodbyes like four years ago? What was your mentality like at the time? Were you quite happy that there was another sort of reunion style thing? Or was it just a case of you were kind of on the roster, so you just went with it? I didn't want to stop being Dr. Stevie. I didn't see a. I didn't see the use for it. You just undid all the damage that WWE did for so many years with the Stevie Richards character. You made Doctor Stevie, which is like I said before, it was a really, it was a real true heel. No, you know, people started to kind of get with it or interested in it, but not liking the character. They wanted to see me get beat up. Yeah. I made Abyss into a once again a strong babyface, and I had so many other babyfaces I could work with. You know, I had, uh, you know, I'm talking about I had good matches with Kurt Angle, good matches with uh, a bunch of other guys, young baby faces too, that I could have did stuff with. And they invested the time and the money into the Dr. Stevie character. Much like what TNA does a lot, they just sort of drop stuff too soon and don't see it through. That's where WWE, we're going to see it through, you know, and and, and we're going to give it a year. Uh, Dr. Stevie got over and under, way under six months. And then just, you know, I got in a better shape, too. I got off some some really, um, I overcame a, an illness I was going through for a few, a few years of my lungs. Uh, and I was on a ton of pregnazone, so I was dropping the weight from being off the pregnazone. That's why I started to really get lean when I teamed up with Raven uh, for some of those matches. And I, I saw a lot more mileage in the Dr. Stevie character. And I really thought Dr. Stevie is a heel against the ECW guys, not even acknowledging he was ever Stevie Richards, but they knew it and everybody knew it. <laughs> I thought that would have told an interesting story too. And did you ever did you ever sort of fight the case of, you know, we've got this great thing yeah. going? And... I would, I would, I would, yeah, fight the case in, as in, uh, you know, everything you say is true, Stevie, and you make great points and we appreciate it, but we're going to do this anyway. Wow. Um and did you manage to even enjoy the angle when it got going, or did you? Yeah, get... yeah, yeah. I enjoy everything I do in wrestling. Don't think I'm. I have you ever seen me in a match where I have that that look on my face like I'm going to do the job, or I look on my face like this match is going to suck? I put everything. I know you can answer it. It's not rhetorical. Have you ever seen me with that? No, shitty I, I look on my face. You do, you do always look very enthusiastic and very into whatever role you're. I get the. I get to do it. something that I've always dreamt of doing in my life that not everybody in the, in the in the world or even in the business has the opportunity to continually do much less on a full-time basis and make a living at it. I realize that every single time my music hit, every single time I I rolled my bags into somewhere and didn't have to show ID at the gate or drove my car into the into the arena in a park, you know, and had that kind of access. I realized that I'm getting an opportunity and it's a blessing, not a privilege, not a right. It's a privilege to be in the business. I, I wish you the best for everything that you, you choose to do going forward and what does happen. But uh, this is the time for you to plug away, sir, for your tech show, your yoga, your, your wrestling. How can people get in touch with you? How, plug away. First thing I want to say is obviously, like I just I just said something halfway negative before. So I want to say, you know, I've been really blessed and privileged to 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 be a part of this business for over 23 years and even continue on and be productive and 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 represent the business. I feel like in a in a very positive, productive manner. So uh, outside of that, I love having other interests. I I. I I enthusiastically encourage every wrestler to have outside interests like like with the certified in DDP yoga and helping change people's lives. So definitely follow uh, me there on Facebook, Stevie Richards, DDP Yoga, or you can email me, Stevie at DDPYoga.com. And, of course, my technology show, T4 Show, stands for Tech Today, Tech Tomorrow. Uh, we actually do a live Google Hangout on air every Wednesday and put it up on the YouTube channel. So check that out at T. The letter T, the number four, S-H-O-W dot com. Well, people will check that out. And yeah, again, thank you for coming back on and talking to us. I hope you've enjoyed it. And um, have a great holiday season. Thank you. You too, man. Take care. Bye.